Okay, so we are recording. Uh, we're now going to go ahead and, and uh, share and do the, the lecture. Um, please make sure that you uh, understand and listen to the lecture, be, be lectures, because it will help you with some of your course material that you're doing in the Pearson My Lab. Okay, so uh, I'm Professor Livingston. As I introduced myself, this is Surf Safe Sanitation. This is the class that you need to pass for your associate degree, uh, which will teach you and train you to take the Surf Safe Restaurant Association Manager's Exam. It's offered through the National Restaurant Association, which is in Washington, D.C. The Florida Restaurant Association in Tallahassee is also a member of the National Restaurant Association. So the exam that you're going to take when you finish this course to become certified is recognized um, in Florida. Okay, so the first chapter and what you're going to discuss is the importance of food safety. And we all know we're in a pandemic right now. So it's imperative that we really know how to sanitize, clean, wipe down and use chemicals to wipe, wipe down sur uh, open surfaces and tables and countertops and anything that's handled. We also wanna learn how food becomes unsafe. Many years ago, when a health inspector used to come in and inspect a facility, everyone would run around and grab a hairnet and get a hat and things like that. And they would think, oh, hey, the health inspector is here and this is a major issue. Well, things have changed. We have something now called HACCP, which I'm going to show you a slide here in a second. It's hazardous analysis, critical control point. What that means is we as managers want to make sure we know the temperature of uh, food when it arrives into our facility from the loading dock and how that food is used throughout production and arrives to our guests at the guest table. This is what the HACCP means. It means following the temperatures and the food handling procedure of the food throughout production. So that's where now everyone's looking at. What is the HACCP? Do you have a HACCP plan and a HACCP strategy? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in further in depth so you understand that. So that's what we mean about temperature control. The acronym is TCS, Temperature Controlled Foods. We want to risk, understand the risk uh, and the factors of foodborne illness, okay? We want to make sure that the reason why we learn and to take these courses is so that we're trained in creating preventative measures for outbreaks and foodborne disease. Um, we want to keep food safe and then become familiar with the HACCP plan. The HACCP plan, you have to study and learn because this is going to be part of your um, uh, sir safe exam. There are seven steps and you have to learn them. Okay, so uh, chapter one, keeping food safe. And then we're using the Pearson Lab Sir Safe seventh edition. Foodborne illness is a disease transmitted from food to people. So most of you know that if you purchase chicken and certain meats in a grocery store, it could already be contaminated with salmonella or other diseases. By cooking the food and using chemicals, this helps to kill some of the bacteria, either using chemicals or, or uh, cooking uh, with food. And um, chemicals could be vinegars, acids, and things like that. We don't mean uh, clean, cleaning uh, sanitizers. All right, so in order to have an outbreak of foodborne disease, it's recognized that two or more people have to have the same uh, identification of that disease or symptoms. And we're going to discuss that a little bit further because it's not as simple as that. Uh, an investigation, once you've declared you do have a food outbreak, an investigation would, uh, you would notify your health, local health department, they would interview you, interview the people that are ill, and then an investigation would take place. Um, the outbreak uh, has to be confirmed by lab laboratory. They take samples of the people that are ill, um, do growth cultures and determine what type of disease they have and if it actually is an outbreak. So these are some of the key factors that you want to understand in uh, pathogenic foodborne disease. Okay. If you have an outbreak of foodborne 
foreign disease in your establishment, what will happen is usually the media gets a hold of this and it'll be posted through social media, could even be posted on the news channels, uh, hard print and the paper. And what happens is people won't frequent your establishment. They won't go there and uh, buy dinners, meals, food, they won't show up. So that's gonna cost revenue. And that's what we mean by cost of sales, cost of revenue. But also you as an owner, entrepreneur, or a chef or a manager running that facility, you're gonna lose your reputation. People are going to say this under this person's watch, they were in charge. This restaurant had an outbreak of food born uh, poisoning. And we're going to show you during the course how you can understand to prevent this, know it's happening, and put in the HACCP standards and preventative measures so that you do not have an outbreak. Um, if you do have an outbreak and guests don't come and customers aren't showing up, uh, your staff's going to have a low morale. They they don't want to be working in a facility that's known for having an outbreak of food poisoning and guests are talking about it. It's all over social media and they're saying you're working over there. This has happened to some major corporations. Chipotle Grill is a good example. Many years ago, they had an outbreak nationally through many of their regional chains and they could not determine what the cause was. It took them months to figure it out and eventually they learned it was raw spinach from one of their vendors that was not being cleaned or washed properly and the water was contaminated with salmonella. So we'll discuss that a little bit further and how to uh, alleviate that from happening in your establishment. Okay, so if this happens, your staff could be missing work because of low morale or they could be missing work because they actually um, and got sick. They were part of the outbreak of the food poisoning. Okay. Um, and you have insurance to cover for outbreaks of food poisoning and other things that happens in your establishment. But if this happens, it could raise your insurance premiums, costing you more money. And with the reputation, staff could leave and it could be difficult to hire and retain more uh, new staff. So there are different um, chemical, uh, different outbreaks of uh, foodborne disease or results of uh, contamination. So biological, which is the most common, uh, bacteria, which is salmonella, E. coli, viruses, which now we know we're, everyone is getting to understand viruses a little bit better with the outbreak of COVID. But the most common in foodborne uh, industry is hepatitis A, and you see on these cruise lines called Norwalk virus, and we're gonna talk more about that. Uh, parasites is common. When I was working at a five-star resort in Hawaii, all over the island, not the resort I was at, but all over the island, restaurants were being del delivered. Romaine lettuce would had little snails, tiny little snails that you couldn't see by the human eye that, um, people were consuming on Oahu on the main island and actually getting sick. And this did make the national uh, and local media news channels because one lady who already had liver disease got sick and died. And it was simply from a parasite that was on the um, romaine lettuce. And then there are different types of fungi, black mold, uh, different types of mold that gets on food. Uh, that could be potentially hazardous to guests if it's consumed. Okay, physical hazards or hazards that are found in food. Um, if you open up a can of, of beans and you find rocks in it, or if you go to a lot of your produce boxes have large staples in them, and your guest goes to eat a salad and there's a large staple in it, um, or a cook has a Band-Aid on their finger and it gets into prepped food, rubber bands. In New England and here in Florida, we use a lot of lobsters and the lobsters have rubber bands on their claws. And a lot of chefs, when they cut the rubber band, it goes flying across the kitchen and it might end up in something and then it ends up into a consumer's dish. Glass. Many times on the cook's line, they use glass to drink beverages, the glass breaks and they don't throw everything away on the hot or cold line and it contaminates people's food and ends up out in the dining room. 
okay? And pebbles and dirt end up into either lettuces, produce, pebbles have been found into canned beans or legumes uh, and recalled by manufacturers. And then there are natural objects, uh, fish bones, chicken bones, etc. When people eat uh, fish or chicken or even a chicken salad, it's expected that they would have uh, small fragments of bone. When people eat white fish, it's expected that the white fish would have a small bone in it. But you as a chef or a restaurant manager want to make sure that the food is cleaned as properly as possible without any bones. But it is expected that there might be a contaminant of a bone in a food. Fish would be fish, chicken with chicken when a guest eats that. But it, it's, it could cause for them to have a choke, uh, choking reaction when they eat the food and this has happened in a restaurant. Chemical sanitizers. Chemical sanitizers should be uh, stored away from food in a separate storage area away from all of your pantry items and your dry goods. Cross-contamination also could be someone's wiping down the cook's line or the cold pantry line and they're using a spray chemical. While the food is out, they accidentally spray it on the food and it becomes contaminated. Another chemical reaction is um, just happened recently in Disney, a uh, janitor mis mixed bleach with another chemical creating a hydrochloric gas and they had to evacuate that certain section of the park because people eyes were burning and they were getting sick. So these are all chemical contaminants. These are uh, results of contam contamination of food. And these are the key areas that you would focus on throughout the course. So risk uh, factors that you have to identify um, to help alleviate uh, an outbreak of food poisoning. Purchase your food a certified vendor. And we're gonna discuss that a little bit further as we go through the course. Failing to cook food properly. That's why we use time temperature ratio when we cook food. That's why we follow HACCP standards. These standards will be written by you as a manager through your menu, menu items from the food that you purchase. You will establish a HACCP plan. This HACCP plan has to be posted and available for health uh, inspectors to look at when they're view, uh, visiting your facility. Hold food correctly. Keep cold food cold, hot food hot. Make sure it's stored at the correct temperature. Using correct NSF certified equipment in your kitchen and practicing proper personal hygiene. You're clean shaven, you're showered, you wash your hands thoroughly, your hair is well groomed, you have a clean uniform while you're working in the kitchen. These are all the five areas that we'll focus on as we talk about uh, proper sanitation. Okay, food uh, that is time temperature abused, and this is called the time uh, temperature danger zone. Food has to be held 40 degrees cold or between 140 and 145 hot. Now you'll notice in your studies, when you go into your textbook, it's gonna say 135 degrees hot or 138. Um, use that temperature. That's the temperature that will be used on the uh, serve safe manager's exam and we'll talk about that more thoroughly um, chicken or poultries or pathogens cooked at 165 degree which is well done well done temperature meaning you're going to use a probe there are various types of probes which are thermometers that we're going to talk about and discuss throughout the course so if i was to take a probe and inject it into a roasted chicken and the temperature on the thermometer read Hundred and sixty-five degrees. That means it takes to cook the temperature at a certain degree. The oven is set on, and that time chicken is twenty minutes per pound. You take the weight of the chicken times the twenty minutes, and that tells you how many minutes it will take to cook a roasted chicken. Then you insert the probe when you think the chicken is done, and then you measure the internal temperature. 
So cross-contamination means when we're crossing pathogenic bacteria with a clean area or a clean surface. So if you have a chicken that's raw and it's pulled out of the refrigerator and you use a cutting board and afterwards you're going to make a fresh salad and the cutting board wasn't taken to the three compartment sink or wasn't cleaned thoroughly and then you go to cut lettuce, you're cross-contaminating the lettuce with raw chicken. That's what cross-contamination means. You can cross-contaminate um, pathogens from transfer from one surface to another. You can contaminate it by adding foods. You take a cold soup out of the walk-in cooler and you don't heat it and bring it up to the correct temperature of 145 degrees and then you dump it into a hot soup that's being held on the cook's line at 140 to 145 degrees. That's cross-contamination. Or you cut raw chicken and cut fresh vegetables or a serving spoon. You've stirred some meat or tongs that you're gonna cook or grill chicken, like a lettuce green or a salad and use the same utensils, you're cross-contaminating. Um, so these are all, all examples of that. We're gonna discuss those more thoroughly so that you understand how you work in a professional kitchen and even in your kitchen at home. You don't want to get any one of your family members sick. And the number one way is not holding food or cooking food correctly and also cross-contamination, not cleaning your utensils or your work surface correctly or not um, combining or combining foods that are not properly held. So, how foods become unsafe is uh, proper personal hygiene, which we discussed. And all of you have been seeing this on the media and social media now because of COVID. Washing your hands, using chemical sanitizers, wiping down surfaces. If you have a cough or a sneeze, especially if you're working in the uh, culinary lab, if you are ill or if you are sick, please do not come to class. We're being very flexible now with scheduling, with posting videos or making up work um, with the professor. So I'd rather you stay home. If you feel you have been exposed to COVID or you were at work and you work in food service and you've been exposed or a family member, email me and tell me you, you're not gonna be in class. We'll follow the proper protocols set by the college um, if you feel like you're feverish or you have a cold or a cough or a sneeze, don't come to class, especially this climate that we're in right now. Okay, and we'll discuss that further if you're in a lab this quarter. Um, open wounds, we need to make sure they're covered, they're clean, they're bandaged. If you have a cut on your finger, you put a bandage on, you put, uh, you double glove it, that's the industry standard. Don't work while you're sick, I talked about that. We discussed proper cleaning and sanitizing and your work surfaces. So um, we'll also, when we get into the labs, I'll discuss this, we'll demo, demonstrate this. I'll walk you around the kitchen and I uh, will thoroughly discuss proper sanitation. Okay, when we get into our uh, lecteria lectures, we're gonna discuss more thoroughly bacteria versus virus and how bacteria get killed and viruses. All of you now should have a little more understanding of viruses since we're in the middle of a pandemic and that's all you hear. But it's with the snail on it in Hawaii. This just happened a couple of years ago when I was in Hawaii. Molds and toxins, we're gonna to talk about that. Walk-in coolers that aren't properly clean can have black mold and toxins in it. Allergens. Uh, and today in our modern cuisine, we have to list on our menu uh, foods that are, people are, are allergic to. So we post gluten-free, lactose-free. We also have vegan dishes, a variety of things on our menus to, so that our guests know that we're taking into consideration their allergens and their special dietary needs. And we'll discuss that a little bit further. Okay. You all have a copy of this PowerPoint. The PowerPoints are listed in um, the assignments and the modules. You can download them during class. 
Um, so if you click on a module and you want a PowerPoint, uh, they're all posted. You can download that for your, your uh, desktop. So the seven steps of the HACCP are very important for you to learn and understand. This will be on your ServeSafe Manager's exam. HACCP stands for Hazardous Analysis Critical Control Point. And if you look at step one and two, this acronym is written out for you. So as I said earlier, the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, came up with a plan 20 years ago that said, we need to understand what causes outbreaks of food poisoning in food service establishment. First, it starts with where does the food come from? So an approved vendor going to your loading dock or to your back kitchen. The next phase is where the food is being used during production. So this means you write the HACCP plan from your menu. Your menu is written by the restaurant manager or the chefs. You write the menu. The menu is written by the theme. Are you a Mexican American restaurant? Are you a French? Are you German? Are you Latin American? Are you Asian? Sushi, Cantonese, Thai, whatever your type of a restaurant, you write the menu. And on that menu, you're gonna have determined what, what is needed. Do I need chicken? Do I need fish? What type of protein do I need? What type of uh, herbs and seasonings do I need? So all of these are going to be used to write your menu. And then during the HACCP plan, you're gonna say, the chicken comes to the loading dock, here is the temperature. Here is how the chicken is stored. During production, we make chicken salad. The chicken salad is going to go to the pantry. Then you'll write how the pantry handles that. So this is a HACCP plan. So you need to memorize this, steps one through seven. You need to take this chart, memorize it, and learn it because on your certification manager's exam, it's going to give you questions and examples of case studies on the HACCP plan and how um, it's being used or uh, we'll discuss it further, but it might say um, example um when the examples and multiple choice then you have to pick that one are there any questions on the HACCP plan any questions all right so perform hazardous analysis is the first step determine the critical control points phase two set critical limits critical limits um measure the parameters of what that protein or that product is going to be used and who's going to be measuring it. For example, the monitoring system would be, it comes to the storeroom. The parameter is it has to be at 40 degrees refrigerated. The established monitoring system is the receiving clerk at the purchasing storeroom dock will take the temperature, record the temperature, and there will be a clipboard. When the clipboard is full, it'll be returned into the kitchen manager and the kitchen manager will be the owner of the temperature of the received food. Then um, what happens is you just do the same thing as you go through the phase of production of the food. It, go, it goes to the hot cooks line and it's prepared for a menu item. It goes to the pantry cold cook line, it's prepared for a menu item. So you take all this into your critical limits. You put this into your monitoring system. A cook takes the temperature and records it. Pantry cook takes the temperature and record it. A kitchen supervisor takes the hot line and cold line temperatures. The chef on the cook's line takes the food temperature before it goes to the guest. Well, that's what it means by the limits. Who is the person that owns recording the temperature? Then it says, who's the person that's supervising and overseeing where these documents are stored? Then step five is corrective actions. So for example, the manager or supervisor comes in and takes the temperature on the cook's line and finds out that someone turned off the hot steam table line or the hot line and everything has been sitting at 70 degrees 
for one hour. Well, the corrective action is the kitchen manager or chef makes everyone throw the food out and reset the cook's line by the standards of the parameters that were established. So the corrective action is everything was thrown out. Then you have to document that. Okay, so that's what steps are taken if someone advisor um, that's the verification procedure there's always checks and balances the storeroom clerk uh, is being checked by the kitchen manager the lead cooks checking the, the hot cook line the chefs cooking checking the lead cook the kitchen manager is checking the chef so there's always a parameter of who's checking and checks and balances now that those guidelines are written by managers and supervisors there's no set guideline that they just hand to you and say here's the half of steps they're all written based on your production schedule from the menu that you've established. So when a health inspector comes in, the first thing they're gonna say, what's your hassle plan? You have to actually hand them a document. You actually have to show them the recorded temperatures. And then next is the record keeping, and that's we discussed, and that's number seven. So symptoms of food poisoning. They're similar to COVID, which is what we're going through right now. Norwalk virus, the flu, um, hepatitis A, they all have the same symptoms. So upset stomach, cramp, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, dehydration. It could lead to long-term illness, as we all know. Um, again, if you have any of these symptoms, a cook, a manager, a supervisor, you don't come in. That goes for any one of these viruses that we talked about. And we're going to get more in depth. We all know the cruise line had many issues with Norwalk virus and Hep A, uh, which were common. Now we're talking about COVID, um, which is transferred through um, humans. Populations at high risk. If we all saw with COVID nursing homes where people got very sick and ill and died. Hepatitis A and Norwalk virus have done the same thing previous to the coronavirus. And we will discuss those more thoroughly. And as we're seeing, these types of viruses affect elderly people, and now we're just recently seeing that are affecting more pre-aged or young school children because their immune systems aren't developed uh, or established yet at a certain age. Um, pregnant women, which we're seeing now, they're carrying child, um, their child, uh, they could get sick, their child they're carrying could get sick. So there are age parameters. The elderly, their immune systems are breaking down because of age. People with low immune systems, people that have uh, cancer, leukemia, other diseases, they're fighting off other diseases. So their immune systems are low and it's harder for them to fight any new diseases that they may uh, 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 get. Okay, there's an acronym that we use called um, Fat Tom. Fat Tom are factors that contribute to micropathogen growth. So on your Serve Safe Manager's exam, the acronym Fat Tom will be on there, and you just have to know what the acronym means. Food, acidity, time temperature, oxygen, and moisture. So food means, you know, chicken may have salmonella before we cook it. Acid means cooking with acid, using acids help to kill some bacteria. Acids are vinegars, wine, um, lime, lemon, citrus acids. Time is time temperature. When I gave you the example of cooking chicken in the oven for 20 minutes per pound at a certain time. Um, oxygen means that things left out in the air, we all know that air contributes to the growth of pathogenic uh, bacteria. Oxygen carries in water, CO2, and also carries pathogenic bacteria in water like salmonella and E. coli that help people get sick. 
And then moisture, moisture creates mold. Moisture creates black mold and different type of pathogenic molds that we inhale the spores and the spores make us ill, sick, and we could die from that. So understand this acronym, learn it. We'll discuss it more as we go uh, throughout class. Here is a chart that what foods are potentially hazardous uh, and cause foodborne illness uh, right away. Okay. We wanna use the HACCP plan. We wanna understand it. That's how we control uh, uh, our temperature control and keeping foods out of danger zone and controlling temperatures through production. We wanna prevent cross contamination. We wanna make sure our kitchen and our restaurant personnel are following personal hygiene practices. We wanna make sure we're purchasing from approved vendors. We wanna make sure our workstations are constantly wiped down and cleaned. And I'll give you a demonstration in class. Most restaurants use the red sanitation buckets with a solution. Since COVID, we have been using chemicals and sprays, which we'll talk about. Um, and so that is basically the overview. This information is coming from the National Restaurant Association out of Washington, DC, which is the owner of SurfSafe. Um, certification courses and the Serve Safe Manager Certification Exam, which certifies you as a Serve Safe Certification Manager.